Hey yo, welcome, welcome everybody. Zach here with Revzilla and this is yet another episode of Daily Rider where we learn about motorcycles as we ride. Our guest today is the XL750 Transalp. That is Honda's latest adventure bike. It uses a 750cc parallel twin and it has a surprising amount of features considering the MSRP is only $10,000. And that means there's a lot of questions swirling around the Transalp, like which bikes to compare it to in the Honda lineup but also in the very rich market of mid-sized ADVs. Some people even wanna know, do I ride it in the street or do I ride it in the dirt? What's it for? Well, hopefully, by the end of this ride to work, we'll have some of those questions answered. You ready, everybody? Let's go. Okie dokie, everybody. Just about ready to go here. As usual, a quick reminder, uh, tip of the cap to the sponsor of this show, which is Revzilla, the YouTube channel that you're watching. Revzilla is a e-commerce company. It makes money by selling apparel, parts, and accessories to motorcycle enthusiasts and those who love them. <laughs> Some of the money that Revzilla makes goes into making these shows, uh, Daily Rider, uh, or the Shop Manual with Ari, or a High Side, Low Side podcast, or CTXP Adventures. So if you like Daily Rider or any of those shows, we just uh, ask that you keep that in mind next time you need something for you and your bike. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Okie dokie. The Honda Trans Alp, the Africa Twin, as some people are calling it. I said it's a 750cc parallel twin, it's actually 755ccs, and it's a pretty standard architecture for motorcycles in this day and age. This is a Honda 270 parallel twin, so it borrows that Unicam technology from that originated, I think, in the CR450, which is designed to be sort of uh, compact and efficient and very Honda. And uh, yeah, we'll talk more about the engine as we ride, of course, but there it is your standard mid-size engine in 2023, basically. <laughs> Aside from the engine, pretty basic architecture, really. It's a steel tube frame, an upside down fork, and a basic shock with not a lot of adjustability. It's an 18 inch rear wheel and a 21 inch front wheel, uh, which is the standard adventure wheel set. Two piston Nissan calipers up here. The sort of basic foundation architecture is pretty standard. There are a couple things I want to call out. Uh, this bike came with the touring package on it, which includes a center stand, um, luggage racks, as you can see back here, uh, a 12 volt outlet in the cockpit, and a taller windscreen, which I replaced. So this is the standard windscreen on there, not the tall one, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, the center stand and the luggage racks especially, I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about weight, which I'll hopefully remember to bring up around then. And of course, price, because those things cost a little bit more <laughs> than the $10,000 MSRP. Aside from that, I think we're ready to fire this thing up. It's got a five inch TFT dash mahuzit here, which is uh, jam packed with info, as we'll talk about whence we ride, and that nice uh, 270 parallel twin thump. Yeah. Like it. Spoiler alert, I like the way it sounds. What else here? LED headlight, which I believe is shared with the CB500X and the Hornet, if memory serves. All right, it's running. I'm starting to sweat from standing in the sun. So let us ride. Oh, I'm a little creaky today. I slapped myself on the ground riding a dirt bike and my ribs are mighty sore. So if I wince or whimper or something, then that's why. <laughs> right, now that we're rolling along here, we can talk about specs a little bit. Uh, and since we're going to be stuck at this red light for just a second, we can talk about that 33.7 inch seat height, which is uh, kind of tall. You can see six foot two. I got a little bit of a bend in my leg, but not much of one. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a full size motorcycle. Also, we'll give credit where credit's due with the price. I said $10,000 is technically $9,999. I rounded up, as I sometimes do, which is mighty fair. The center stand I point out there is a couple hundred bucks. A full set of saddlebags is gonna cost uh, 1,100 bucks or something like that. And the 12 volt outlet is something like uh, 40 bucks or something and uh, adds uh, obviously a very small amount of weight, but the center stand and the saddlebag mounts certainly contribute to the weight, which with a four, full 4.5 gallons of fuel in the tank, this sucker tip the scales at 472 pounds, 
which is a little higher than what you'll see on Honda's website, probably in part because of those accessories on the bike, which is uh, understandable, I would say. Other specs that are notable is the claimed horsepower, which is 90, I believe, or 91, and uh, 55 foot-pounds of torque, which is pretty stout numbers. Um, the V-Strom 800, for example, that we tested earlier this year on Daily Rider, uh, is I think the engine's only a little bigger, despite the 800 nomenclature versus 750, but I think the engine is only a few cc's larger, but still claim almost 10 horsepower less than the Transalp. So yeah, the engine packs a punch. Well, now we're out on the open highway here and I haven't even talked about basic ergonomics, but you can probably guess what it is and that's it's pretty comfortable to sit on. Very, very relaxed, extremely upright and decent wind protection at highway speeds, though we're not quite at highway speed yet. Had a question on social media about whether or not the bike is smooth at highway speeds. Oh yeah, big time, smooth city on board the Honda Transalp. It's great, the engine's so good. It's just, it could do this absolutely all day for years on end, I assume. Another thing worth pointing out regarding highway manners for the Honda Transalp is the seat, which initially I thought was kind of stiff and it might be a little bit stiff, but if you swing a leg over it in a showroom and you think that it's too stiff to be comfortable, I vote you give it a chance before you order something from the aftermarket because I spent uh, I don't know, at least a few hours on end uh, on this bike and never really got tired of the seat, in part because I think it's a nice shape, but also in part because you can slide forward and back pretty well. You can move to the back pretty easily where it's a little bit wider. And if that suits your buns a little bit better, then you'll probably like that, especially for taller riders. You'll appreciate having the room. In general, good marks for the seat, especially for a $10,000 bike. One other quick note on the windscreen. I think it's darn good for what it is, considering it's a sort of non-adjustable situation that's not super tall, straight from the showroom. Even at six foot two, I think it's decent. I do get a fair amount of wind noise depending on the situation. This speed, 60, 65, not too bad. If you wanna go 75, 80 all day long and you're over six feet, that's when you're really gonna appreciate that tall windscreen. All right, this is usually where we talk about fuel economy and range. My numbers have been in the mid 40s. I think 45 to 48 is where the tanks of gas that I have burned through have landed. And interesting note, I think, is that the onboard computer, oh, son of a, the onboard computer is actually pretty accurate. So right now it's saying we're getting 49 uh, for this tank. We've burned through 2.2 gallons. And yeah, the consumption in gallons is actually pretty helpful because the fuel gauge, uh, as is the case with many bikes, is can be a little bit wonky, right? It can stay full for a long time and then it like quickly goes down to half or something like that. Uh, but the consumption number is pretty accurate. Uh, so four and a half gallons I found when I filled it up, it was it was within a tenth of a gallon of being right on the money of what the bike actually took versus what it said it had used. So that's pretty rare for an onboard computer to be that close to accurate, um, but, uh, but a nice feature. All right, we happened to catch the drag race and stoplight aboard the Honda Africa Twin. I'm going to put it in sport mode and experiment with the quick shifter and with wheelie control, which I don't think are especially flattering, even though the bike packs a good punch. Ready, here we go. And we're away. <laughs> it sounds wicked. I like it. <laughs> And actually, the sport mode traction control worked quite a bit better than I think I had been using gravel or standard or something like that. And I found the traction control to be really intrusive. And like when it cuts in, it just like, uh, kind of like crunches your crotch against the tank and like it cuts power in a way that feels like it's trash control from 2012, not 2024. But that was actually pretty good. Very, very tame. It kept the front wheel on the ground, didn't allow anything crazy to happen, but uh, allowed the engine to spin up to redline and accelerate and use that quick shifter, which, incidentally works quite a bit better at full chat wide open like sort of sport bike style than it works in mid revs which we'll experiment with as we do the round town challenge back to fuel consumption range really quick i saw a couple of reviews online that said oh you can get well over 200 miles on a tank because it gets you know 45 50 miles a gallon and it has a four and a half gallon tank but i found myself wanting to fill up before 200 miles, which for a bike like this is just about good enough. I'd love to see it with 200 and 
220, 225 mile range, which you could squeeze out of it, but you're less likely to do that. It's a nitpick, but some nits need to be picked, you know? As we come to the end of the highway section, you will notice that I did not use cruise control because the Trans Alp does not have cruise control. And that is a pretty big miss, I gotta say. I know it's a it's a budget-friendly bike. It's like the price starts with a nine for crying out loud, Zach. You want every bike to have cruise control. I just, it's so modern and sophisticated and feels so expensive and nice in so many ways. And it has ride-by-wire throttle. Why isn't there cruise control? <laughs> Why? I'm not sure. Maybe next year's model or something. Anyway, time to enter the stop sign challenge with the Honda Trans Alp, where we try to get to zero miles an hour and not put our feet down. It is the test on Daily Rider of Roundtown Manners, slow speed poise. And I gotta say, this bike's pretty good. It's very just predictable and easy. And I think that just about sums it up. I got distracted on the highway complaining about no cruise control and I forgot to talk about the mirrors on the Trans Alp, which um, are great. They're so good. They're, I don't say they're perfect, but they're closer to perfect than they should be considering, uh, I don't know, the price of the bike. Not that good mirrors are expensive, it's just like I've ridden so many expensive bikes where the mirrors are awful. And then you ride something like this and you're like, yeah, they just care to do a good job and the mirrors are smooth and they're in the right place and they're the right shape. Doesn't seem that hard. Anywho, let's see if we can get another footless stop here, huh? Come on, Zach, you can do it. Yes. Right, approaching this stoplight, we could talk about the dash, I reckon. I think we have a little bit of time. Uh, hopefully the glare is not too bad, a little hard for me to tell. Um, yeah, pretty basic dash, five inch dash, which feels a little small as Airy pointed out because of this black ring around it. You know, it feels like it should use all that space. But uh, in general, a nice setup. Uh, like the sort of analog fuel gauge, got a touch of class to it, the faux analog tack, and the refresh rate on the dash is nice and high, so the tack needle is easy to track and sort of looks realistic, if you will. And then, yeah, all this uh, data down here on the bottom, right? You got uh, trip meters and you can control it with these um, up, down, side to side button here. You got um, all that data that you can cycle through. The secret handshake, oh, we're gonna have to talk about the secret handshake to get to the menus at the next traffic light. But in general, I like the dash, aside from it being just a shade small. All right, as we come to the end of our neighborhood challenge here, I promised that I was gonna complain about the quick shifter, and here it goes. The upshift function just isn't quite right. The tuning isn't quite right. It has sort of like an odd bulk See if we can get it to do it here for accelerating second gear. Maybe it doesn't seem bad the way that I'm doing it, but I can promise you that it feels awkward. It feels like it needs to shift uh, quicker. Like it's stuttering the ignition a little bit too much and it kind of like, uh. it is adjustable in the menu before you trans Alp owners start cracking your knuckles to leave a comment that I'm doing it wrong. I tried all the three different adjustments for the quick shifter and none of them did the trick for me. I think it's just, um, a little yeah it's better in the top three gears than the bottom three gears but in the meat of the revs where you find yourself most of the time or where i find myself i think it's um, a little bit lackluster the only piece of good news is that the downshift uh, as we'll experiment coming to the stop sign are great really good satisfying make a great noise and it feels like an appropriate blip just the opposite problem that the uh, v-strom 800 had if you remember All right, Lover's Lane, where we talk about passenger accommodations and there's no cruise control, so I can't do the thing where I sit on the back and talk about it. I'm so sorry that I'm not able to do that. Passenger accommodations are fine, nothing to write home about. I meant to check to see how well my wife's feet fit on the foot pegs with the saddlebags in place. I failed to do that, and I am sorry. If you care, my Instagram DMs are open. <laughs> the one piece of commentary I'll offer on the stock saddle is that it is a one-piece saddle and I feel like the space behind where I am inclined to sit as the rider is pretty large on the rider's seat which I said on the highway is nice because you can scoot back right it gives you room to kind of scoot back and move yourself around on a long road trip but I do think that that shelf where the passenger sits might start to feel a little bit far away in some situations which uh, could lead to a potential lack of comfort and a relationship chagrin but you know I don't know your life so 
I guess you'll have to let me know how it goes. In general, I think you'll find that the accommodations are just fine. Alrighty, into the twisty road section. And if you know Daily Rider at all, you're prepared for me to tell you that a mid-sized adventure bike with a 21 inch front wheel is a perfectly good sport touring bike. And you're probably less surprised to hear it this time than you were with the Tenere 700 or an Aprilia Touareg 660, which we will talk about more later. But this bike is great for this kind of thing. The quick shifter works well enough in these situations that it's satisfying to use. The engine makes a great noise. It's got super linear power. The suspension is not adjustable, but it doesn't need to be for you to enjoy leaning on the tires. It's got excellent poise and character. And just like almost every other situation that the Trans Alp is in, it just feels more refined and more sophisticated and, um, and more expensive <laughs> than it should. Already down out of the twisty road section and back onto surface streets, which is a fairly sad thing to do on the old Trans Alp. Such a sweetheart in the curves. Had a good time there. Right, what have we got to talk about? I guess we could shortcut some of the stuff on the dash by talking about the ride modes, uh, of which there are five. As you can see with this mode button over here on my left thumb, if I uh, tap it, I can do rain, gravel, user, which is customizable, sport, and standard. One thing that is pretty un-Honda that I enjoy is that in the user mode where you can calibrate all these different settings for the throttle map, engine braking, trash control, and ABS, is that you can turn off trash control on the fly. Uh, you can adjust traction control on the fly in general, which, uh, hot diggity dog, pretty good. Okay, let's talk about brakes real quick. Good brakes. Typical, I would say typical Honda brakes. Just, you, you know, you look at them on the spec sheet and you see, oh, axial mount, two piston, Nissan, you know, blah, blah, blah. It just seems so lame, but they work great. And the lever's adjustable and I just don't have any complaints. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna be at this stoplight for a hot minute, I think, so we can continue our discussion of the dash. I was talking about uh, this data down here on the bottom. We talked about the general information that's shown up here. And one thing I like about the dash is it gives little cues of what to do. So there's this function button here, right, FN? And you can see uh, right now, for example, it says, there's a little cue there that says FN reset. So if I wanna reset trip to, or reset this uh, dash, I would hold function. I kind of like that. And the same thing happens when you adjust uh, the user mode, for example. Let's go into the user mode here. If I hold it down, I believe, yeah, it'll allow me to make some adjustments here. And you can see it's telling me uh, right, left to select, which is, you know, kind of intuitive. Um, and up, down to adjust, which is nice. And when you go to trash control, it says if you hold down the up, then it will shut trash control off which we'll do just to show you that you can. And you get this little light here on the side. Anyway, I just think it's nice. Uh, and you hold the mode button down again and it sticks and uh, it's all very just, it makes lots of sense considering how complex it is. Well, just like that, it's time to go. So I'm gonna need three traffic lights to talk about the dash on this bike. Gosh, that's a new one. Well, for now, we'll talk about the engine a little bit more. Sometimes we address the engine in the section of the ride and say like, well, would you buy this bike just for the engine? In the case of the Trans Alp, I think so. Yeah, I think it is a purchase worthy engine. It's really, really good. It's just, it's punchy in the right ways. It makes a nice amount of horsepower. It sounds delightful. It's, it's just like linear and predictable and smooth and the right amount of raucous. It's sort of a show of force from Honda, in my opinion. You know, the company decided to build a middleweight ADV a little late, you might say. Uh, but as far as the engine, man, they hit the nail right on the head as far as I'm concerned. If I was going to level a criticism at the engine, I would say it's maybe not as playful as a Tenere 700 engine or even a Touareg 660. And you know, it's not as rowdy and sharp and aggressive as the Aprilia engine or as a KTM Parallel Twin or something like that. But I'm just like, again, I hate to keep going back to this, but considering the price point it's playing at and like what it's supposed to do, I just think it over delivers big time. <laughs> So 
So as we come to the end of the ride here, I wanted to address where this bike sits in Honda's lineup. Someone asked on social media, is it a bigger version of a CB500X or is it a smaller version of an Africa Twin? And the answer very clearly in my mind is it's a small Africa Twin. It feels so much like an Africa Twin, not necessarily from identical ergonomics or, um, or you know, power or features necessarily any of those things, but just the feel of it, the feel of the engine, that, that sort of like Swiss watch kind of sort of feels substantial in all the right ways, even though uh, it's not hugely heavy for the category. Uh, I just think it's, as I, as I pull off a lovely full stop, I think it's very balanced. I think it's a very balanced bike. Um, it does not feel like an engine that has been repurposed and put into an ADV bike. It feels like it feels like an adventure engine in an adventure bike with with true adventure on the horizon. And I'm I'm impressed. I really like this bike a lot. And just like that, we are gonna take it down this dirt road shortcut. once this enormously long train goes by. Come to think of it, this uh, we can finish talking about the dash now, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the secret handshake I was talking about is that you hold uh, this button to the right um, and then you pull up this menu, that's all. And uh, from here you can access all the sort of basic settings, uh, date and time, screen brightness, uh, the quick shifter settings I was talking about, you can have three different settings for um, for up and for down, uh, which is kind of nifty in my opinion. And uh, yeah, self-canceling turn signals and you know, mumbo jumbo like that. Nice clean menu, easy to navigate, easy to use, a little tricky to find, but once you know how to find it, all good. If the dash were 10, 15, 20% bigger, I'd be absolutely blown away. As it stands, totally functional, works well, but yeah, maybe just feels a little small in today's market. Yeah, all right, looks like we're just about at the end here. So I can fire the bike back up and we're almost ready to go. Let's uh, get ahead of the game here by putting it in gravel mode. But TC is turned all the way up in gravel mode, which is uh, whatever. I guess we, we owe it to ourselves to try gravel mode since we're going in the gravel. And here we go. <laughs> Yeah, the TC is very interesting on this bike. It's um, it's quite conservative in almost every mode, in my opinion. Um, it gives you an idea, like in gravel, it'll allow the tire to spin a little bit, but then you see that I just had it wide open and it wouldn't even, it's like barely moving. Like sometimes it's, it's sort of like, feels like it's ready to be rowdy and like actually kick the bike ahead like that. But then other times you snap it open and nothing happens. It's kind of strange. Let's go back to user mode. Oop. The TC off. And we can experiment with TC off in general. <laughs> yeah. Wow, there's a lot of traffic here. Let's go play around in the dirt some more, shall we? This bike is, uh, is a pretty good dirt bike, in my opinion. It's got pretty lenient ABS. And if you shut off TC, you can rip around here in the dirt. You can feel confident, even with these kind of street tires on it. You feel like you're in command. Is the suspension kind of soft? Like when you start boosting off water bars, are you gonna bottom it out? Yeah, definitely. But I would like to make it very, very clear to those who thought that the Transalp was just, uh, <laughs> was just a sport touring bike. And uh, people, some people didn't think it should be compared to a Tenere 700 or a Touareg 660. I disagree. I do think it's a little bit more of a street bike than those bikes, but I don't think it's fair to condemn it to just that. It's a, it's a ripper of an off-road bike. Very, very cool. <laughs> and I think it's gonna make a lot of people really happy. All right, now we find out if it can do a wheelie, I suppose. And I think I know the answer. Oh yeah. Oh, look at it go, look at it go, everybody. Big, mean, trans-alp wheelie, woo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. <laughs> Just 
significantly more character and and excitement than I think many people were expecting from this bike. Myself included. Absolutely myself included. <laughs> All right. Last question to answer, or almost last question is, can you back it in? Yes, you can. <laughs> Let's put this sideways for an ADV bike. Uh, you can adjust traction control on the fly. You can shut off rear ABS. You can do all this stuff that normally you can't do on a Honda. <laughs> and I don't think it's Honda turning over a new leaf. Honda's been around too long for that kind of thing, but it sort of feels that way. It's freaking delightful. Now for a U-turn challenge, which like most other challenges, I think the Transalp will take on quite well. So flying up on this line here, we're gonna go full lock left, feet up. Oh yeah, that's like one and a half maybe. That's a nice tight turning radius. So much poise. Good bike. Really good bike. I'm uh, struggling to come up with a lot of complaints for this sucker. It's even got a steel tank, I think, which means a magnetic tank bag will work, which is great in my opinion. What a riot. It looks good all dirty. And doesn't it sound bitching? Is it just me or what? Yeah. It's wicked. It's got, a, it's got a nice snap to the exhaust note. I think my least favorite thing is that they didn't make it look like a little Africa twin with the twin headlights and it deserves that. All right, let's answer some Instagram questions. Okie dokie, first question here is from One Hot Mutant who asks, uh, as a CB500X owner who loves the fuel efficiency, the ease and comfort of riding, the ability to low-key handle most all situations, is this worth an upgrade? So this is an interesting question. I got another question that basically said the same thing. Like I, I had a CB500X as my first bike. I love how approachable it is. Is this bike as approachable? The short answer is no, it's not as approachable. The phrasing of this question, is this worth an upgrade, is a tricky one because I want CB500X owners in particular and anyone who's in that category of motorcycle to be careful thinking that the Transalp is just a really kind of like polite, low, easy motorcycle. It is in many ways in, in the sort of middleweight ADV segment. I think it is quite approachable, but it's also a big step up in power and in weight and in seat height. It's only like an inch of seat height, I think, and, and maybe 20 more pounds than the CB500X, but to me, it kind of feels more than that. And I mean that as a compliment, not because this bike is big and heavy, but because the potential just feels so much higher. Ultimately, that's good. I just want anyone interested that has the same question as One Hot Mutant here to keep that in mind. So is it worth the upgrade? Yeah. As far as potential, it's definitely worth an upgrade, I think, if you're interested in this type of bike. What I don't want you to do is think that it has the same demeanor or use case. Hopefully it'll expand your horizons, <laughs> um, but just expect a quite a bit bigger, burlier bike. That's all. Up next is a question from Barnshaw, who asks, weird comparison, but this versus the Honda NC750X, which we've also covered on Daily Rider, by the way, what would be the better choice for someone who is a daily commuter, but also a weekend warrior? So this question is a little bit broad. What I was interested in with this question is that a lot of people commented and said, yeah, I want to know this too. This versus NC750, like they seem so comparable. And to me, they, they're not really comparable at all. <laughs> they have a similar size engine and they sort of sound similar and they almost look similar if you squint a little bit, <laughs> but they're very, very different bikes. The NC is a great bike. I mean, it's built to be a city commuter, right? If you have any ambition of going down a dirt road or, or splashing through a mud puddle or anything like that, you want this bike. Don't get an NC. The good news is there's tons of overlapping capability. If you just want to ride around the city, but you think you're going to want to go to the mountains once a month, then this bike will work great for that. You're not going to give up a whole lot. You're going to give up some efficiency. You're going to give up the ability to get DCT um, option, the dual clutch transmission, automatic transmission, and you're going to give up the frunk, 
among a few other things. So yeah, you make some compromises to get this bike instead of an NC, but if you want a wide variance of capability, the Transalp is the way to go. If you're really focused on urban, suburban riding or the convenience of having a lockable waterproof storage on board, that kind of thing, those little features and quirks that the NC750 has, then that's your bike. But ultimately, pretty different mantra from each bike. Hopefully that helps. All right, I hesitate to answer this question, but I think it's a good one and it's probably worth talking about. John Mark Bennett asks, I want all the middleweight comparisons. Yamaha Tenere 700, Aprilia Touareg 660, uh, all the V-Stroms, <laughs> BMW GS 800, KTM 790, Triumphs, whatever. Uh, there are a lot of good bikes in this segment. Does the Honda stand out? Good question, ultimately. I'm not going to talk about literally every single one of those bikes, but I think that the real standout to me, where this bike stands out, is... For a long time, the Yamaha Tenere 700 has been kind of like just the ultimate bang for the buck bargain in the middleweight category, right? It's 10,000 something, 107, 10, 104, whatever. Uh, I think it's less than $11,000, and you get a you get a lot of capability for that uh, historically. In 2024, I should mention that the Tenere 700 is updated, and I have not ridden that bike as of the recording of this video. But the T7 has owned that, and the Transalp, I think sneaks in and undercuts the price by a little bit but really what it does in a lot of ways is undercut the price and offer some of the things that competitors were offering people would say oh should i get a tenere 700 or an aprilia touareg 660 because the touareg 660 has all this you know it has different ride modes it has a bunch of adjustability in electronics and stuff like that and those are excellent features to chase in a bike if you want to pay twelve thousand and change right for an adv the honda comes in and with this transalp changes the game a little bit. Now you can have a lot of the adjustability and have a lot of those electronic features for less than you could have, than you would spend on a Tenere 700. So it's it's making its mark in certain ways. And all the other bikes, really, in my opinion, a KTM 790 or 890, a Triumph 850 Sport, or even a Tiger 950 with Tiger 900, Vistrom 800, BMW GSs, like those bikes are all a lot more expensive. Even a Touareg is 20% more expensive than a Transalp, which is not nothing. And is the Touareg a slightly lighter, more agile, more uh, trail-ready weapon? Yeah, it is. And it has some features that the Transalp doesn't. I'll admit that. But the value that Honda is throwing out here with this bike, like the engine character or the sound of it or the feel of it, like it feels high quality. It feels great. It feels different than a T7. Not not the same kind of playful attitude, but, but not worse. And that's to me, remarkable. And I, I think that that's where the Honda stands out. It really changed the game for options available and character available for that price point. Hopefully that helps answer your question. All right, last question here. We'll, have, we'll do a fun one, as always. Uh, this comes in from Justin. We have a situation. Who says, if it was a Disney animated movie, which one would it be and why? Love this question. So I spent some time thinking about this. Not a lot. <laughs> I'm going to go with Aladdin. This Honda Transalp is the Aladdin of middleweight ADVs. To me, Aladdin, sure, it's a classic now, but if you think about it, like it was just the sort of like, you know, poor boy, rich gal love story that I think on the surface of it didn't really look like much. You know, you're sort of like, okay, yeah, they said it in a faraway time and place, but really it's just this sort of like the beggar meets the princess and they fall in love. Like what's so interesting about that? But anyone who's seen Aladdin, I think you have to agree, what a terrific movie. What, what, a, what a dynamic cast of characters. I mean, it, it, it's a classic for a reason. Not to mention, the soundtrack absolutely slaps. And I think the Transalp's kind of like that. It's, it's so easy. There have been so many comments that I've seen of people saying like, oh, it's too bad that it's going to be boring. It's too bad it's a Honda. It's, it's more than that. Give it a chance, man. I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed. It's like, it's in some ways the bike that I thought the V-Strom 800 would be. It's the bike that it seems like the new Tenere 700 is reaching for to a certain extent. I'm not going to say it's a total bullseye because I don't love the way that it looks. I don't love that it doesn't have cruise control and it has some cost cutting stuff that isn't necessarily flattering, but man, foundationally, is it a, just a terrifically capable bike that really kind of scratches most of the itches that I think people will have. Same with Aladdin. You can watch it again and again, and it's enjoyable. And I think this bike is going to be ridden again and again by many, many different people and enjoyed every single time. Okie doke, everybody. That's it. Thank you so much for your questions again. Uh, let's jump inside and put this sucker on the Daily Rider leaderboard. All right, everybody, here we are inside Revzilla West at the Daily Rider leaderboard with, uh, I believe, the final machine of the 2023 season here. Um, we've got 20 some odd bikes and uh, it's been quite a ride. There will be 
an update um, or synopsis video that we'll post near the end of the year. So just stay tuned for that before we kick off into 2024. So to get down to brass tacks, where do we think the Honda Transalp falls? You will know at this point in the ride that I'm a fan. It's a good bike. Is it as hoot and holler fun as a Kawasaki Ninja 400? No. Is it as powerful, as exciting as a Hayabusa? No. Is it as sharp as a Ducati Street Fighter V2? No, it's not. Is it as handsome as a Triumph Bonneville T100? No, it's not. But what it is, is the best daily rider that we've covered this year. It is better than I thought it would be, and I like it better than the V-Strom 800 DE. But don't just take this as my preference, because I think one of the reasons I like the Honda Transalp better is that it's lighter than a V-Strom 800 to the tune of 50 pounds-ish. It's cheaper by 10% or more, maybe a thousand or so dollars. And it also just sort of like hits in all the ways that I wish that bike did. I don't really like the V-Strom 800 very much, but it is an undeniably good daily rider. It's very, very good. The Honda Transalp is also undeniably good. It's also objectively better in some ways. And I just think it's got that crackle. I think most people that ride both of these bikes will agree with me that it's got, it's got, a, little, got a little extra something that it shouldn't have, that it doesn't need to have, that it, I didn't expect it to have um, for, for that price point and for the sort of, um, you know, just browsing the spec sheet. I didn't necessarily see that coming, but, but I'm impressed with that bike. I think it's quite, quite good for what it is. And uh, I think it's gonna make a lot of people happy. And I think that Honda will eventually update it to look a little bit more like the Africa Twin and then everyone will be happy. Oh, and cruise control, right. Okay, that's it for this episode of Daily Rider. Thanks so much for hanging out. Um, like I said, stay tuned for the uh, recap video at the end of the year. And um, depending on when you're watching this, happy holidays. <laughs> and I uh, hope you learned something, hope you had fun. There's a lot of noise outside, so I'm gonna go. Bye. Guess we'll just uh, take a quick break then. Well, actually, this is the perfect time to talk about, um, yeah, I know, we see you. You're absolutely massive. This would be the first time to, whoa, gates going up, that doesn't seem right. There we go.